Okay, so it's Dr. Rago here, plastic surgeon from Valley Plastic Surgery here in Brisbane. Um, thanks for joining the discussion and the group. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about rhinoplasty. Um, firstly, this is my practice, uh, Valley Plastic Surgery. Um, I and Dr. Matthew Peters are co-directors of this practice. And we have three other plastic surgeons amongst us, Dr. Theo Birch, Dr. Brendan Louis, and Dr. Andrew Hadge, who's recently joined us. Um, so we're on. Okay, so please feel free to ask me any questions about rhinoplasty, anything pertaining to the nose, um, including revision rhinoplasty as well, because uh, that's an area that I work quite a lot with. So I wanna answer some of the common questions about rhinoplasty, some of the concepts and principles of rhinoplasty and some of the questions that you've also um, already sent through to me to discuss. Um, firstly, who does rhinoplasties? So you may know that rhinoplasty surgery or no surgery is done um, with, by ENT surgeons as well as plastic surgeons. I think things have changed though from maybe 10 years ago. I think in this day and age, if you're gonna call yourself a no surgeon or a rhinoplasty surgeon, you should be able to address both the functional as well as the cosmetic aspects of the nose. Because most patients when they present for rhinoplasty will have both issues. If you have a crooked nose with a big hump, then it's likely that you might have a breathing issue as well. And you cannot just correct the cosmetic side without addressing the functional side. So I think gone are the days whereby um, one patient has an operation where an ENT surgeon as well as a plastic surgeon turns up and both operate on the same patient and one's responsible for the cosmetic outcome and one's responsible for the breathing outcome. Um, I think a plastic surgeon or an ENT surgeon should be able to both make the nose look the way the patient desires as well as breathe better if that is an issue. So I think, um, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're ENT or plastic background. I think if you've had sufficient training, expertise and experience in rhinoplasty, um, you should be able to fix both the functional as well as the cosmetic side of things. Now the other concept that um, I want to focus on and discuss about uh, is the principle of destructive versus constructive rhinoplasty. Maybe from about 10 years ago and in times before that, um, a lot of surgeons would be doing what would be called these days as destructive rhinoplasty. So if you had a big nose and you wanted to make it small, you just remove cartilage. And in doing so, you actually remove a lot of the support of the nose and maybe five years and 10 years down the track, the patient may have a collapse or breathing issue as a result. So when it comes to nose surgery and rhinoplasty, a good result is not determined at six months or one year. It's actually determined five years, 10 years down the track because the nose keeps on changing. And if you don't have the support there, then the nose can um, not look so nice five years, 10 years down the track. And I'll touch on that a little bit more when we talk about revision rhinoplasties. These days, we tend to focus more and teach more on constructive rhinoplasty. So we have to focus on our goals, both cosmetic and functional. But when we're doing the rhinoplasty, we have to make sure that the nose at the end of the operation is very, very well supported. For example, if we're gonna make the nose smaller and we take out some cartilage, we're gonna use that cartilage. We're not gonna throw it in the bin. We're gonna use that cartilage to support and stiffen and make much stronger the remaining part of the nose. So that's the concept of destructive versus constructive rhinoplasty. You want the nose to be stronger than what it started off as. Um, the next question I have is one pertaining to common presentations of rhinoplasty. What are some of the common reasons why people want to have a rhinoplasty? Well, it depends really on the ethnicity of the patient. I did my training um, after I finished plastic surgery training in Australia. I went abroad to both Asia and North America. 
for further training and specialization in cosmetic surgery, including rhinoplasty. And it really depends on the ethnicity of the patient. For example, in the Asian population, most noses are smaller and flatter, and most Asian patients would like a higher bridge and a pointier nose. So in those cases, you're actually doing an augmentation rhinoplasty, making the nose bigger by either placing an implant or using the patient's own cartilage. If you're seeing a, a um, African patient, um, their presentation is completely different again because they have a large tip with a very arched ala and a very flat dorsum. So in those patients, again, they may want a more defined dorsum, a finer tip, and a reduction of the ala so that it's not so flared. The most common presentation in Australia, however, is with Caucasian patients, which is a dorsal hump and a bulbous tip. That is a Roman type hump on the dorsum uh, together with a big tip. So the approach in those cases is usually a dorsal hump reduction together with tip refinement. But it's often much more complicated than that. And oftentimes you have to spend a bit of time with a patient to decipher where the concerns lie and where the goals lie and how do you get from one to the other. And, uh, and I'll go on to that a little bit more in terms of my assessment of a rhinoplasty patient and how I consult a patient during a rhinoplasty consult. So um, we've touched a little bit about the aesthetic or cosmetic side of rhinoplasty versus the functional breathing type of rhin rhinoplasty. I would say the majority of my patients will come with both issues to address, both functional as well as cosmetic. And then only some patients who purely have a cosmetic concern and some patients who purely have a breathing issue to address. Um, okay, another question that was asked is in relation to Medicare and private health fund coverage for rhinoplasties. What are the qualifications for rhinoplasty to be supported by Medicare and also um, private health funds? Purely cosmetic rhinoplasty, <clears throat> where it's, it's, the patient has had no history of trauma or any breathing issues, then that's purely cosmetic and it's not supported by Medicare or private health fund. So they're the two quali qualifications for a complete, fully or partially medical rhinoplasty. It's either the patient has a breathing issue or the patient has had a trauma in the past. Um, yeah, so there's a question that's come up. If it's functional, is it covered by Medicare? It's partly supported by Medicare and your private health fund if you have a breathing issue. Um, so it's a breathing issue or previous trauma that's caused a deformity. Um, each of those will qualify um, support from private health fund as well as Medicare. So it's not a completely, entirely cosmetic rhinoplasty. And I find the majority of patients do have an aspect. They've either, either traumatized, broken their nose in the past, and that's why they've got a crooked nose or a big hump on the nose, um, or they have a breathing issue with a crooked septum, deviated septum or, or a crooked nose. Sometimes it's genetic as well. They just have a uh, crooked septum or a narrow internal valve or a weakly supported nose genetically that's causing them breathing issues and it doesn't necessarily have to be caused by trauma. <clears throat> I hope that answers that question. Um, okay, here's a, um, a question. Someone's asked that they're worried about getting the rhin rhinoplasty the first time. What are the main reasons why someone has to have a revision rhinoplasty? Okay, so I see and do a lot of revision rhinoplasties. Um, the revision rhinoplasties are always very complicated and difficult for many reasons. Number one, you're not quite sure what's happened to the nose in the past, what the previous surgeon has done, how much cartilage is left, how much scar tissue there is, 
Um, and especially if you don't have previous operation notes, um, it's very difficult to know what's actually been done to the nose and you can't figure everything out just by physical examination. And a lot of uh, what happens in the revision rhinoplasty is determined intraoperatively by intraoperative findings. Um, oftentimes I will try to see if I can get um, operation notes from previous surgeon. Uh, however, on many occasions this is not possible. Um, either the surgeon's retired, moved on, or the patient has had it done overseas. Um, and it's not a big deal if the patient doesn't have the operation notes from previous surgery. It does help, but it's not a, a deal breaker because um, physical examination and preparation for the patient to expect all things that can occur and all findings that we may encounter and all treatment options, as long as that's explained, then um, the patient is okay. Um, in a revision rhinoplasty, what are the main reasons why someone has to have a revision rhinoplasty? Well, the two common um, issues are number one, breathing or nasal obstruction post rhinoplasty. Um, I see a lot of patients who have had rhinoplasty one, two, three, 10, 20 years ago, and now they're having difficulties breathing. And this is usually when too much cartilage has been removed and not enough support has been implemented in their nose. Um, and this is quite um, easily picked up on examination as well as on a CT scan. Sometimes the patient has had a previous operation that's resulted in a crooked nose or a crooked septum. That's another reason why a patient may have breathing difficulties. But um, more commonly, I find that it's a lack of support where too much cartilage has been removed and the nose is now just waving in the air and very flimsy and ill-supported, um, and the patient has a, a, a lot of trouble breathing. And breathing is essential to life. It's very important for quality of life. You need oxygen. And so um, patients who have trouble breathing, it really impacts on their quality of life. So that's one of the main reasons why people have revision rhinoplasties. The second is obviously cosmetic. Um, if the patient's still not happy with the cosmetic appearance of their nose. Now you've got to keep in mind that after rhinoplasty, the swelling can take up to a year to dissipate and the final result may not be apparent until 12 months post-surgery. And so, you know, if you're still waiting for that 12 month period, I'd say be patient and see how, how much more the swelling goes down and how the, the healing occurs and how the scarring occurs um, before you consider a revision rhinoplasty. So patients may still be unhappy about any residual hump in their nose if not enough um, hump has been removed. Sometimes there can be an excess of scar tissue built up. Sometimes um, the uh, nose is not very well supported and so they get a recurrence of a bulbous nose or a collapse of the tip. And so if the patient is not happy with the cosmetic appearance, then they may need a revision. So in essence, um, again, the two reasons for primary rhinoplasty are also the two reasons for revision rhinoplasty. That is breathing difficulties or the patients, uh, they, don't, they still don't like the appearance of their nose. And so, again, I'll come back to that when I talk about consultation and assessment with the patient because you want to avoid and prevent a revision as much as possible. Nobody likes revision surgery. The patient don't like it, surgeons don't like doing it because it's difficult, it's challenging, but it's difficult. Um, and it, uh, it can have a higher revision, revision surgery can have a higher risk of complications and further revisions. So if we can avoid that at all costs, then that's the way to approach it. Which leads me to the next thing, which is when I consult, a patient for rhinoplasty, we have to determine the issues or the areas where the patient has concerns over. When I give the patient a mirror and ask them to point out to me the areas of their nose they don't like, I will go further. You know, if a patient says, I just don't like my nose, or I don't know why, I, I just don't like my nose, that's not good enough. You have to be very specific in the areas of your nose that you don't like. Think about the dorsum, which is the bridge of your nose. 
What is it that you don't like about that? Think about the tip. What is it that you don't like about that if that is an issue? Think about the projection. Is it too far forward or not enough projection? Think about the angle of rotation. Is it too rotated? Is it not rotated and too droopy? So I make patients list down and outline for me no more than five issues that they're concerned about with their nose. Because once you go beyond that, it becomes very complicated and the goals can become quite exhaustive as well. And when it's too many, when you're trying to fix too many things, it becomes harder and the risks of surgery becomes much higher as well. Um, so if a patient is finding it hard to decide, you know, what is it that they don't like about nose, I do give them a helping hand and we'll go through what is it about your doors and that you don't like? What is it about your tip that you don't like? What is it about your ailers that you don't like? What is it about the tip projection or rotation that you don't like? And then we'll think about our goals, where we want to head towards. What sort of a tip are we looking for? What sort of a doors are we looking for? For example, most females, in terms of the bridge of their nose, would like a straight nose with the slightest of curvatures to it. Slightest of curvatures, most females. If they ask for a completely straight nose, then that's what we're aiming for. But I find in general, most females would like a slightly curved dorsum, which often gives a much more feminine appearance to their face. Whereas most men would like a completely straight nose. Okay. I, uh, some men do ask for a slight curvature if they have slightly more feminine um, appearance to their face, um, but more commonly they just ask for a straight dorsal. Um, okay, here's a question. Uh, what can I ask my surgeon to make sure they're going to minimize scarring? External scarring and rhinoplasty is probably the least of your concern. Now, I'm going to talk about what a closed rhinoplasty is and what is an open rhinoplasty. An open, the only difference between a closed rhinoplasty and open rhinoplasty is a tiny maximum four, five millimeter incision just at the columella, which is here in the middle base of the nose right here. That's all. That's the only difference between an open and a closed rhinoplasty. In an open rhinoplasty, you get a little cut in the columella area and the rest of the cuts are on the inside of the nose. The same as a closed rhinoplasty. Which one do I do? I prefer an open rhinoplasty. I've been trained and I've done plenty of both closed and open rhinoplasty. But these days, my preference is by far an open rhinoplasty. Because in my hands, an open rhinoplasty affords me a much better view, much more precision, and really the only downside is a tiny little scar here, which always almost heals up very inconspicuously. So this external scarring is not a concern. What is more of a concern in terms of scarring is internal scarring. Because internal scarring is what happens on the inside when the nose heals. If you have a buildup of scar tissue, you may still have a big tip or a big, big um, nose because if the scar tissue builds up, it can affect the final appearance of the nose. The other thing which I often fear in terms of internal scarring is causing an asymmetry because even though the nose is still is a central object, it still has a left side and a right side. And as such, if one side heals up differently to the other and scars differently to the other, it can potentially cause asymmetries to the nose as a final result. And that's why I would like to see my post-operative rhinoplasty patients at one week three weeks, six weeks, three months, six months, a year. Uh, that's just to monitor how things are healing. If there's any signs of asymmetry or adverse scarring, then we will do something to um, fix that, such as taping the nose. And that leads to, you know, we can talk more about post-operative recovery and follow-up and things that I do to try to minimize swelling as well as scarring. But in terms of external scarring, that's the least of your concern. Um, there are surgeons who have a preference for closed rhinoplasty. There are surgeons who have a preference for open rhinoplasty. My preference is personally open. And I know a lot of my colleagues, especially the, you know, internationally, a lot of the more very experienced rhinoplasty surgeons are converting more to doing an open rhinoplasty. Um, whereas for most of their life, they've done closed rhinoplasties, but 
They've just found that an open approach gives them a lot more precision. You can see the cartilages, you can see the bone, you can see the septum much more clearer than trying to operate through a small hole within the nostril. Um, okay, next question we have here um, is, <clears throat> what are the different rhinoplasty techniques and when is each used? What is the difference between an open and closed rhinoplasty? We've discussed that already. Look, techniques are just multiple. Rhinoplasty is one of the most, considered one of the most difficult surgical procedures in all of plastic surgery. Not just because the nose is in the middle of your face and it's visible to the whole world, but it's because every millimeter in a rhinoplasty counts. It's a three dimensional structure and it's a complex structure. The nose is made up of the nasal bone from the top. Then you have your upper lateral cartilages, which can affect your breathing. Then you have your septum in the middle and then you have your ala cartilages and every presentation, every patient that comes to see you is slightly different in their anatomical makeup. So you have to, there's no, um, rule book or cookbook recipe for noses you have to see what the patient's presenting anatomy is what their concerns are where their goals lie and see if you can match all three into the equation to deliver the results that the patient's looking for um, you know i do a lot of breast surgery as well breast reductions breast augmentations breast lifts um, those sort of breast type procedures can be quite tricky as well. But if you compare, say, a breast augmentation to rhinoplasty, then the presentation uh, varies a lot more um, in a rhinoplasty procedure just because um, of the different structures that's involved in the nose and how manipulation of each one will affect the other. So there are many different techniques and it's an ever evolving um, subspecialty within plastic surgery um so it's difficult to talk about what are the different techniques because there literally is thousands of techniques done by different surgeons and in different surgeons hands some techniques work more than the other but in general uh, i come back to the concept of constructive rhinoplasty if you're going to change the nose in any way both uh, the shape of the nose the size of the nose and the breathing ability of the nose you need to support the nose at the end of the case and so to support the nose, you need cartilage. Where do you get the cartilage from? The best source of cartilage is within the nose from the septum. And then you can also have um, cartilage from the ear or the rib if required. Okay, uh, next question I have here is, what are the diff, uh, sorry, what is the estimated recovery time of a rhinoplasty and how soon afterwards can I return to work and back to the gym? Oh, so I'll wear reading glasses, how long do I have to wait after my rhinoplasty until I can wear them again? Okay, so uh, when you have a rhinoplasty, the recovery time really depends on the extent of the rhinoplasty. A revision rhinoplasty, for example, you know, they're out for three, four weeks. Whereas the primary rhinoplasty may only be out for about two weeks in terms of um, time off. And after one week, a patient comes back, they're usually very swollen, very bruised. They'll still have the splint on and the internal splint and external splints will be taken out at one week together with a few stitches right here in the column mallet, which will be removed at one week as well. After a week, I tend to tape the nose to try to reduce and help with the swelling. And by about two weeks and three weeks, most patients are okay to go back to non-laborious work. So office type work, like work, they can go back to that. But the noses will still be swollen even after two or three weeks. And again, swelling would differ from patient to patient. Um, in terms of exercise, the thing with exercise is that when you're exercising, you're upping your heart rate, the blood rushes to your face and your nose will swell up. So I'd say in general, walking is perfect. You can do that the next day. But in terms of rigorous activities and exercises such as um, a running or CrossFit, um, that will be about four to six weeks because if you start exercising too early, you're going to rush the, all the blood to your nose. It's going to swell up and it's going to delay your healing. So my suggestion is always to wait about four to six weeks, as with most other surgeries, um, before you go back to rigorous activities. But walking is fine. Okay. There's a question here by um, a member 
of the farm to say, what are the risks with the rhinoplasty? I want to make my nose smaller, but I'm concerned about being able to breathe properly. So the, the, there's an exhaustive list of complications when it comes to rhinoplasty and septorhinoplasty. But the most common ones I'd say that I stress the patient are number one, breathing obstruction. And in my experience, one of the things that I fear is internal scar, which causes asymmetries. Um, breathing difficulties is sort of um, minimized by the fact that we support the nose. If the patient already has a slightly borderline airway, we tend to support the nose um, with intent. That is, if we make the nose smaller, we have to widen a, a certain part of your airway called your internal valve. And if you have flimsy ailers and flimsy nose, we have to support that as well. So it is possible to make a big nose smaller, but my assessment would have to um, suss out whether the patient has a good airway to begin with, a borderline airway or a bad airway to begin with. If they have a bad airway to begin with, then we need to support the airway, but we can still make the nose smaller um, in profile, but there may be certain limitations to that. Yeah. Um, I've spoken already about scarring that causes asymmetries and that's probably my greatest fear and that's why I see patients quite regularly after rhinoplasty just to make sure that they're healing up okay. Okay, so um, what are the keys to good outcome in a rhinoplasty? Um, in most rhinoplastic consultations, I'd spend about 45 to an hour, 45 minutes to an hour with the patient. Um, <clears throat> first thing I do is ask the patient what the what is it about their nose that they're not happy with. And I give them a mirror and they point it out to me. If they can't figure out what's what they're not happy about their nose, then I can't do the surgery. I can't do any surgery. A patient has to be very specific about the areas of their nose that they don't like. And this can be a dorsal hump, a bulbous tip, a tip that's under projected or over projected, um, too much ala flaring or nostril show, um, or any other reason. But they have to list out for me the areas that they, they're not happy with. And then we have to discuss our goals. Um, yes, sure, you can show me noses that you like, but I cannot guarantee that we're going to be able to achieve that nose because there can be limitations. It's like a, a canvas that you're working on. Um, you can make it as good as you can, try to reach the goals that the patients wish, but I will tell patients if they show me a nose that just is not possible with their starting point, I will definitely mention to that, that patient. Um, do I use any morphing software? I, I have that, I don't use it all the time. Morphing software is basically you have a photo and I have a 3 D program which we can morph to um, like reduce the, the dorsum or reduce the tip to get a, a a goal after appearance that we're looking for. So that's that's what morphing is. Now I do have the program for it. I don't use it all the time. Um, I use it sometimes, but more of a tool to illustrate to patient how we're gonna get from A to B. So what we're gonna do, what we're gonna to try to do, because these morphing programs have their limitations as well. They do not 100% predict the final outcome. It's purely an indication of what we're trying to achieve. So I don't use it all the time, but I do use it sometimes, especially in complicated cases where if the patient's still having troubles in understanding what we're trying to achieve, then I may use the morphing software uh, to do that. Um, Feel free to ask any questions that you might have about rhinoplasty. <clears throat> okay, now someone's asked the question of um, revision rhinoplasty. Now, is, is revision rhinoplasty common? Not that common, but I, I see quite a few patients um, every week for revision rhinoplasty. Um, it's a difficult thing because number one, surgery may have taken place a while ago. Number two, you may not have 
the operation notes of the previous surgeon, so you're not quite sure what's actually been done to the nose. So you can only deal with the nose as it presents to me. Um, and number three, revision rhinoplasty is always much more complicated. And I have to stress the patient that we cannot get it absolutely perfect. We can try to aim as good as we can, but we can't get it perfect because of the limitations in the revision rhinoplasty. There's more scarring. The blood supply to the skin is not as good. And the cartilage that we can use that's available um, as cartilage grafts is much more limited. So in revision rhinoplasty, we often will require the use of cartilage because as I mentioned before, one of the more common reasons why people have revision is because they've lost support to their nose. Their nose is collapsed, their tips collapse, the dorsum's collapse, their valve collapsed, so they can't breathe properly. To fix all that, you need cartilage. You need cartilage grafts. And the best source of cartilage graft is always from the nose itself, from the septum. However, this is often removed by the previous surgery, by the previous surgeon. And I'll see patients who've had three, four, even five previous surgeries. And definitely by that stage, the septum has been used and there's nothing left inside the nose to use. So what do you do in those cases? Well, you need the cartilage graft. If it's only for a small piece of cartilage, I may take it from the ear. Sometimes we take it from both ears. If you actually need a strong piece of cartilage, you have to go to the rib. And um, it's not taking the whole rib, but just taking a small segment of the cartilage part of the rib. And we'll make an incision about four centimeters or so. In a female, we tend to go in the breast crease, and in the male, we go straight over the rib, and we can harvest a bit of the rib and use that as our cartilage graft to reconstruct the nose, to make the patient's nose look better, more supported, and also breathe better as well. But it's another, you know, scar in, in, in the chest. And so that's why revision rhinoplasty takes so much longer. My average primary rhinoplasty duration is about two to three hours, depending on what's needed. Um, but revision rhinoplasty can take five to six hours. And oftentimes patients have to stay uh, in hospital at least overnight for that reason. Are there any questions at this stage by any of our members about rhinoplasty? No questions? Okay. Um, I can talk a little bit about the way I do a rhinoplasty. Maybe just more, more of the technical aspects of rhinoplasty. So, um, and, and I'll just see if there's any, any, any members who have questions. <clears throat> so let's take you through a um, common presentation for rhinoplasty. Someone who comes into my office and says, I don't like the hump on my nose and I don't like how big my tip is. After going through what our goals are, um, that is to give a straight, oh, here's a question. With revision rhinoplasty, is the cost the same? Good question. Um, it depends. It depends. Um, it really depends. First of all, the question before that very question is whose revision is it? Is it your surgeon's? Is it the surgeon's own primary case? Um, and then he has to do a revision on it, in which case he may not charge any um, surgical costs because he's doing the revision. However, if the surgeon is different, which in most circumstances that's the case, then revision rhinoplasty is often more expensive than the primary rhinoplasty because there's more work involved, it's more complicated and more complex and risks are higher, takes more time and oftentimes requires um, a hospital stay. Now I touched a little bit about what the Medicare and private health insurance qualifiers are for rhinoplasty. That is, if a patient has breathing issue or if there's previous trauma causing a deformity, the same applies to a revision rhinoplasty as well. So in order for a revision rhinoplasty case to be qualified as fully or partly medical, the primary rhinoplasty, the first operation, initial operation, has to have either been a fully or partly medical rhinoplasty. That is for breathing obstruction, 
or trauma causing a um, nasal deformity. <clears throat> so revision rhinoplasty, is the cost the same? No, it's not the same. It is often much more. And the reason for that is purely because it's harder surgery um, with much more time and expertise involved. Yeah. Hope that answers your question um, about revision rhinoplasty costs. So I'll go back to talking about a patient with um, a dorsal hump and bulbous tip. <clears throat> we'll discuss what her concerns are. In my examination, I'll feel the nose, have a look at the nose, both from the front, from the oblique angle, from the profile, from underneath, from on top, and then I'll have a look inside the nose. When I look inside the nose, we'll often use a little instrument like this. It's called a nasal speculum. It goes inside the nose. I won't, I won't stick it up my nose. Uh, it goes inside the nose. It, uh, you can just open up the nostril and then you shine a torch inside. And the reason why we do that, looking inside the nose, and this is an essential part of an examination, is to assess the airway and assess the septum. Because if the septum is bent, that could be the reason why um, a patient may have breathing issues and that needs to be addressed by a septoplasty. Septoplasty is essentially a, uh, any surgery to the septum to improve um, the breathing. So once I've assessed the, um, the inside of the nose, I may actually find that the nose is um, a little bit crooked on the inside. And if I see that the outside is a little bit crooked as well, I will correlate this to my internal findings as well. So this hypothetical patient may have a dorsal big Roman hump and they've got a big tip and the nose may be slightly crooked. Um, and when you ask them about breathing, they may say, oh yeah, I have a bit of reduced breathing on one side and you test this as well, block the nose, get the patient to breathe in, see if it is um, blocked more on one side or not. Um, and then <clears throat> the... Uh, Next thing that I would do um, would be to discuss what the goals of the patients are. So in this hypothetical case, they may want to... Okay, just following on with uh, one of our members' question, if you did a rhinoplasty for a patient and they not happy with it, is it another cost? Um, that would depend on the surgeon, I think. Um, each surgeon has their own personal um, principles um, by which they, their practice follows. Um, and, and some surgeons will differ from other surgeons. I think in general, however, um, if a rhinoplasty was done by, by a particular surgeon and the patient is not happy with the result, um, the, per the, the surgeon usually should, in principle, um, try their very best to try to um, improve things, if that's possible, and um, try to achieve what the patient wishes, um, if that's possible again. Yeah. <clears throat> um, oh, there's just a hello there. Hello. Okay, so back to our, our hypothetical um, patient. So once I've examined them, I may or may not do the 3D morphing, but I'll discuss the goal. So in this particular patient, it's a dorsal hump reduction to get a straighter, straighter dorsum or bridge of nose, refine the tip, straighten the nose by doing a septoplasty and supporting the septum once we've straightened it, and perhaps to um, support the tip as well. Now, we schedule a date. Almost all my rhinoplasties uh, are done under a general anesthetic. A general anesthetic is just a full anesthetic with a uh, anesthetist involved in it. Um, most rhinoplasties are done as day surgery cases, so there's no need to stay in hospital overnight unless it's a revisional case or a much more complex case. Um, the first thing I do is make it the little cut in the columella or the central base of the nose right here. And then from there on, the rest of the cuts are all on the inside of the nose. Once we've done that, we identify the cartilages of the nose 
and you have two sets of cartilages, the lower and the upper cartilages. Beyond that, we get to the nasal bone. We have to expose all these areas, identify them, expose them, and assess them. It's what I call a nose timeout. So once I've opened everything up, I have a timeout and assess what the underlying cartilage structure is like and how it correlates to what the appearance, external appearance of the nose is like and also to my clinical findings in my notes as well. Sometimes you can come across some findings only when you open up the nose. So in this patient, the first thing that I'll do is take the hump down. So it could be three millimeters, four millimeters, five millimeters, depending on what the patient desires. You take down the cartilage part of the hump, which is usually the septum, and then you take down the bony part of the hump. And we usually use that either with a, um, a, a burr or a rasp. Now, once you've done that, you may require what we call a nasal infracture. What is a nasal infracture? So if you go to see someone for a rhinoplasty, they may mention to you that they're gonna break a bone and move it. And that's called an infracture. The reason for an infracture is if you're taking down a hump, say for example, that's your nose, and you're taking off a hump of your bony dorsum. Once you've done that, your nose is gonna be like that. It's gonna be wide. And so you actually need to chip along the side of the bone on the nose in order to bring everything in together again. So here's a, a model of a, a, a um, skull. And so you can see the dotted lines along the side of the nose, there and there, on the side of the nose. That's usually where we do our nasal fracture or an infracture once we've reduced the hump. If you don't do an infraction, the patient may end up with what we call an open roof deformity, and that's a really wide nose. A reduction rhinoplasty is a three-dimensional procedure. So you don't just get rid of the hump and give the patient a nice side profile. You need to reduce it three-dimensionally, and so therefore you need to also bring the bone in together as well. Now, <clears throat> how, do we, how do we break the bone of the nose? That's been one of the, um, for me anyway, one of the big changes in the last couple of years. Traditionally, for the last 10 years in private practice, I've used a chisel to chisel the side of the nose bone, to crack it and to move it in. But in my experience, even though that can be fairly accurate, there still is a slight risk of a maldirection um, fracture and the bone cracking in the wrong way um, because it's not entirely under control because you're, you're sort of chipping and guiding it along and sometimes it, you can have the crack of the bone go in a misdirection. So one of the things that I've started using about two years ago is called a piezo system, which is an ultrasonic um, machine and you can use ultrasound saws to cut the bone. Uh, this, for me, this technique is more accurate. Um, there's a lot of irrigation during the cutting, so there's less heat, less bleeding, and also the swelling is much less as well. And I've seen this in my results. The swelling is much less than if you were to use a chisel to do an infracture of the bone. So, you know, okay, um, here's, here's a question. Um, I'll just answer the questions as they come along. How long is the recovery time for rhinoplasty? Uh, as I mentioned, it depends on the extent of the rhinoplasty and what's involved. Um, in general, patients come back at one week, they're really swollen and bruised. And that's when we take the external splints and the internal splints out, we remove the stitches. And by about two weeks, the patients are still a bit, a bit swollen, a bit bruised, but by about four to six weeks, most of the swelling should be gone. However, it does take a good six to 12 months for the eventual results to show. So in terms of going back to work, most non-laborious, non-manual labor type of work, two weeks should be sufficient. Um, someone else asked about whether you're able to wear glasses. I think if your glasses can fit over the splint that we put on, fine, that's fine. And I think unless it's a really heavy uh, set of spectacles, I think wearing glasses is, is fine after rhinoplasty because it's, it's not actually that heavy and it's quite symmetrical in its weight distribution as well. 
How long is recovery? Um, about two weeks before patients can go back to office duties. Um, however, not all the swelling and bruising will be gone, so you might still have people wondering what happened to you. By about four to six weeks, most of the swelling and bru bruising should be completely resolved, and that's when you can start rigorous exercises as well. <clears throat> so going back to the um, going back to our operating room, I was talking about the ultrasonic um, machine that we use these days. We can use them. Um, it's an ultrasound machine that has different tips on it. You can have a saw, you can have a burr, you can have a scraper. And in my experience, um, it's become much more accurate. There's less guesswork in, in bony, bony work for the nose because uh, you actually see where you're cutting instead of sort of going through this area here and chipping uh, guided by your fingers only or chipping from the side again guided by your finger and hoping that it's all been cracking in the right spot majority of times it does crack in the right spot but um, because you can't actually see it um, you are not 100 percent sure uh, so this new ultrasonic machine that i've been using in my writing classes for the last two years for me has been a game changer um, i probably won't go back to just using chisels um, I still have a lot of my own chisels, brand new ones that I've bought that I've never used. I might sell them on eBay. Um, but the ultrasonic machine is um, is been one of the game changers for me in terms of working on the bone um, in a rhinoplasty. So once we've infractured the bone of the nose and brought it in, um, the next thing we have to look at is how we're gonna support the middle part of your nose and oftentimes we usually will just use your, your remaining cartilage and reinforce that. And then we come to the tip. Um, and most, most patients have a broad, wide, square, ballish, bulbous tip. To refine the tip, we often will use stitches to bring them together a little bit. And we may trim off a tiny little bit if they're really large um, in terms of their lower lateral cartilages there. Once we've done that, we need to support the tip and we use part of your septal cartilage as a graft to support your tip um, so that it doesn't just sort of uh, blow in the wind and is unsupported because in every rhinoplasty, the moment you enter the nose, you're already disrupting all the ligaments that support the nose. So at the, uh, during the surgery, you just need to support everything so that the nose actually ends up being stronger than what it was um, prior to the operation. Um, once I've done the dorsal work, the oh, before the tip, I would often do my septoplasty, that is straightening any part of the septum that's causing a breathing obstruction um, and supporting it if necessary. And then we get onto the tip work um, and then we support the tip and then we close. And for primary rhinoplasty, that usually takes about two to three hours. Um, revision rhinoplasty is a complete, total different game. Um, and when we close up, all the internal stitches are usually dissolving and the external stitches, there's usually only about four of them that require removal and they're really fine stitches. Once we've done that, I will usually place internal splints inside the nose. Um, I don't pack my nose anymore. You may hear about horror stories of patients who the next day or the next week have to have this long strip of cotton packing removed from the nose. It's like tearing the brain out. Um, it's very uncomfortable um, and uh, I, I don't do that anymore because these days I just use a silicone splint on the inside and that slips out quite easily at about one week after surgery. Um, I'll put an external splint on as well which is a plastic one um, and that comes off at one week as well. Question from anonymous member, do you do bullhorn lip lifts? I have done bullhorn lip lifts um so what that is is essentially taking a wedge of tissue out from underneath the nose and because your nose is shaped this way the wedge that you take out looks like a horn of a bull this procedure is done for patients with long upper lips um i have done this before it's not a difficult procedure you're just removing a segment of skin to to lift the upper lip upwards to make this area between the base of your nose 
and the top of the lip shorter. The only downside to this bull horn lip lift is scarring. You have to take that as a serious consideration because in most cosmetic type procedures, we don't want the stigmata or the, the stain of a scar that gives away the fact that we've had surgery. <clears throat> this applies in breast augmentation, um, breast lifts, breast reductions, tummy tucks, rhinoplasties, facelifts, brow lifts, anything. So in a bullhorn lip lift, you will end up with sometimes potentially a very obvious scar underneath your nose. Sure, with time, this will fade away, but it is a serious consideration. And if you're from an ethnicity that is a little bit more prone to bad scarring, such as Asian or dark skinned individuals, then this is certainly not an operation I would suggest because if you get a keloid or a hypertrophic scar in this area, it will be very visible and difficult to hide. And um, bad scarring such as keloid um, is uh, very difficult to treat. <clears throat> Um, another question is, can rhinoplasty be done under local or has, has it got to be done under general in hospitals? <clears throat> There's very few rhinoplasties other than limited rhinoplasties that I would consider doing under local anesthetic. For example, ALA base reduction, where someone has a very flared ALA or wide nasal base. This is a classic example of where a limited rhinoplasty can be done under a local anesthetic. Um, and that, that would be just be an injection into this area here and removal of a wedge of tissue to make the nose smaller and narrower at the base or to reduce ala or nostril flaring. So that can be done easily under the local anesthetic, although some patients choose to have that done as part of another procedure all under the same general anesthetic. Now, if someone only needed a little bit of tip work, then perhaps this can be done under a local anesthetic. I do find, however, that the majority of my rhinoplasties, um, even if it's tip work, will be done under general, general anesthetic. It's just much more comfortable for the patients, um, especially if they're young, fit, and healthy. And um, it counts for a lot, you know, when it comes to comfort during surgery. Injections into the nose are very, very uncomfortable very uncomfortable. I mean, as plastic surgeons here in Queensland, we do a lot of skin cancer work. And I can tell you, an injection into the nose is very uncomfortable, let alone opening your nose and working on your cartilage. Now, um, rhinoplasty doesn't have to be done in a hospital setting. It can be done in a day surgery facility, of course, and a fully accredited day surgery facility with a fully qualified anaesthetist as well. Uh, so in general, it is usually done under a general anesthetic. However, for limited rhinoplasties, I have done it under local anesthetics. But it's just much easier under a general anesthetic, especially if they're fit, young and healthy. Yep. Okay. Um, any other questions? Let's have a look. We've talked about who does rhinoplasty? We've talked about constructive versus destructive rhinoplasty, common presentations, functional versus aesthetic rhinoplasty, Medicare and private health insurance qualifications, common reasons for revision rhinoplasty, uh, what's involved in the revision rhinoplasty, uh, keys to a good outcome, um, and areas of dissatisfaction um, after rhinoplasty. Um, Please feel free to forward any questions about noses. Um, what else is there? <clears throat> oh, yes. Um, so common reasons for revision rhinoplasty. We've talked about breathing obstructions. Um, we've talked about asymmetry. Talked about sometimes noses can be, you know, due to scarring or previous surgery too short. For example, raised up, too much nostril show, piggy nose. Um, if that was the case, then the patient needs to have their nose lengthened. And to do so, you actually need a lot of cartilage um, to push the nose out more forward, more down, and give it more projection. And oftentimes, this would require rib cartilage 
that's that's one of the common things that that I face um, when I see revision cases. Another very common revision rhinoplasty presentation is a very unsupported tip. You can literally push someone's tip down and it hits their face. It's flat. It flattens. And when they have such an ill-supported flopping nasal tip, again, you need cartilage there. And oftentimes we would do what we call a septal extension graft um, to give strength and support to the nasal tip. Now, one of the downsides of supporting the nasal tip is that the patient's tip feels very stiff. But I actually tell the patient that that's not a bad thing in the long term. Sure, it will soften up somewhat, but having a strong, supported, stiff tip is much better than a nose that's ill-supported. Um, so unfortunately, stiffness and strength is one of the potential cons or downsides of supporting the nasal tip. But I see it as actually a positive because in the long term, it's going to be a lack of support that's going to cause issues. Um, what else is there in rhinoplasty? Okay, Trish, um, are there any other questions in regards to rhinoplasty? Oh, one other thing. One other very important thing. It's, um, and that's about facial proportions. Um, when a patient comes in for rhinoplasty, the other facial structure that I always look at is the chin. Because if the patient's chin is not very strong or is very weak or under projected, it can make the nose relatively big. I've had patients who have come in asking for a rhinoplasty and I've actually ended up doing a chin augmentation or a chin advancement for them, either with an implant or a genioplasty procedure. So that's very important when you're analyzing someone's face uh, in a rhinoplasty consult. I've done a lot of patients where I've done the nose and the chin together at the same time. If they need a chin enhancement to give overall facial balance, um, plus they also need a rhinoplasty to reduce a large nose. So it's very important to also look at the chin and whether there's enough projection there um, to balance up the face and not just uh, the nose on its own. Oh, here we go. Question, uh, what would you do to correct a long nose with large nostrils as part of a revision rhinoplasty. Um, it's hard to know what you mean by long nose. I, pre I presume you mean the, the, the vertical height of the nose is long and not so much the projection because the, the, whenever we talk about length of nose, whether the patient has a long nose or short nose, it's this right here. If it's long or short, when you look at a patient from the front and from the side, if it's long, you can lift it up somewhat. Um, if the tip is drooping down, you can lift it up, but you need to support it. So you may use uh, a columella graft or a septal extension graft, and you can take this from the septum and just lift that tip up. If the tip is lifted up, it will give the overall appearance of the nose being shorter. Um, and with regards to large nostrils, um, again, large nostrils can be either due to an under-projected nasal tip. For example, if your tip is under-projected, your nostrils will appear quite large and flared. Um, and, and sometimes just projecting it and lifting it up will improve the overall shape of the nose. If the nostrils themselves are flared, then you may need an ALA reduction. Um, so it depends on what the, um, what the nostrils look like. Um, without without a photograph or, or a view of it, it's, it's hard to say. Um, so that's where experience comes into hand. And, you know, after you've done a few, quite a few, you kind of know where the issues lie and what sort of tricks in the tool bag um, can be used to try to achieve the goals and correcting the um, issues. Ah, projection. Okay. So... 
Ah, I see. So what do you do to create the long nose? You mean projection? Do you mean it's too projected? If you mean it's too projected, that is it sticks out too far, you can deproject it. Um, but again, you may need to have a graph there to hold the deprojected nose in the, in the right spot um, for consistency. If you simply deprojecting it, because deep, to deproject the tip, you need to either remove or overlap a little bit of the cartilage right here in the middle called your medial crura of your lower lateral cartilages. So if you make an incision and then you overlap it, you can deproject the, no the tip of the nose. But once you've done that, you need to support that entire complex with something. Otherwise, it's prone to move any way it wants to. It's prone to even collapse and deproject too much. So you need to secure it in place, usually with a graft. So if by uh, too much projection, um, you can certainly have that deprojected um, with a revision rhinoplasty. However, deprojecting a nose can run the risk of making your alas flare out a little bit because when you push the nose backwards, your nostrils can flare out a little bit. And this may sometimes need to be um, compensated by doing an ala base reduction. But again, it depends on the, um, the patient's presentation. Hope that helps. Hope that helps. Okay, um, that's pretty much rhinoplasty and revision rhinoplasty in the wrap. Um, is it common? Yeah, it's very common. Um, have I done rhinoplasties together with other pr pr procedures such as breast augmentation? Yeah, we can do that. But it all depends on the, the complexity of the procedure. If it's a uh, complex rhinoplasty, then I probably will just do the nose um, and a, a different pr procedure at a different time. Um, it's all about safety and, um, and uh, the general anesthetic time as well. Just like any procedures, you know, sometimes you can do multiple body contouring procedures at the same time, um, but this is of obviously associated with higher risk levels. And the same goes with rhinoplasty combined with other procedures. You can um, if it's within safety limits. Okay. Um, no problems, Trish. More than welcome. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Well, I'll um, sign off now. Um, if you, anybody has any questions, feel free to send us an email at um, info at Valley Plastic Surgery. You can send along any photographs um, for me to have a look at, to assess, to give an opinion, um, and um, we'll be in touch soon. Okay, bye-bye.